fun. So we're in the brand new, in the process of opening, uh, practice of Dr. Brett Butterfield in the grand metropolis of Meridian, Idaho. And I thought what a better opportunity to talk about building a brand new practice than here with my good buddy Brett. So I built uh, two practices. Uh, the first practice I built, uh, believe it or not, when I started my very first practice, it was uh, what was then called, and probably still in some circles, a box on the wall practice. Meaning I literally had a box on the wall, it was a mailbox, and people put whatever donation they wanted to put in that. So I didn't want to turn anybody away. And uh, I'll just let people do that. Well, after a couple weeks and not having enough money to pay for groceries with my, for my family, my young family at the time, I uh, went ahead and started charging <laughs> for what I did. And I got a business, uh, business coach. I've had a few business coaches over the years that have taught me some good things. But my, uh, my first practice, after that misstep, um, once I really started uh, working a little bit smarter in my practice, I developed um, up to about 400 patient visits a week with a particular model of promotion and uh, did some changes to the promotion and took my practice up to 900 patient visits a week. And uh, we'll talk about those models. And I, I had a high volume practice for several years. And then I had a daughter develop leukemia. And when she developed leukemia, I, I had been a workaholic, obviously seeing that many patients and the number of hours I worked was, was quite a bit. I wanted to spend more time with, uh, with my kids. And so I, changed to a different model that wasn't so intensive. Plus I also felt that I was part of the reason that she um, got sick because I wasn't holistic enough, I wasn't watching enough areas of her life and her health um, to prevent that from happening. And so I went more into a holistic type of practice and I developed a specialty practice this practice, instead of being a family practice, I really um, promoted to one population, one patient population. And it's a little bit different model. And I developed a, a by this point I was all cash, and developed a waiting list practice um, catered to a specific population. We'll come back to that. But I'm gonna have you move the camera in quite a bit closer because I'm going to be turning a little bit, plus I don't want to keep yelling across the, the space. And so my model, there, there are certain things about the model um, that are really quite similar to both. And so I'm just going to draw that whole pattern out. So the, the first question that you have to, or problem you have to solve, is you have people out here in the deep blue sea and you have a practice over here. And what you want to do is get people from here to here. But it doesn't necessarily happen through magic. You can't like hit your heels together three times and all of a sudden there's a bunch of people there. So how do we get people out here into here? There's a lot of different ways to do it. My primary way has always been to teach. I've always taken the role as doctor, as teacher, um, very seriously. It's not something I just give lip service to. I, um, my first practice, every single week, I taught a class and invited people into that class every single week. My second practice, I did it once a month. My first practice, I had a lot more people, 
the model of my first practice was to make less per visit, but see more visits. The model on my second visit was to make more per visit, really more per patient, and have fewer patients. So just two very different models that way. But the first thing, we always just call this a lay lecture. The lay lecture was my, in the first practice, I just talked about my general practice model. I just explained, thank you. Um, I just explained what it is that I, I do. Um, explained what health is about, how I saw health, how I saw health differently from other people, and about the services I provided, which was the chiropractic adjustment, how that fed into a, a wellness paradigm, and how I wanted to be their doctor. And I feel that at the, the lay lecture, the most important things to communicate is that one, you're not a hypocrite, that you're actually healthy and take care of yourself. Two, that you're smart, that you actually know your material. And three, that you care deeply about your patients, that you're in this business, sure, to make money, um, to have a great life and things like that, but you're really in it to make a difference for people, and so they can, they can feel that. All of those things can be true, and you can still fail to communicate them. And that's why it's important to build your workshop so all of those things get communicated. I, um, in my second model, my first model, I wasn't doing TBM at that time. But in my second practice, I always showed the TBM video. The reason it's important to show the TBM video is People don't have a context to understand what it is we do. If you were to go into a deep jungle where no one had ever been around any type of Western civilization and someone had a bad fungal infection in their feet and you were to get a little white antifungal pill and say, here, swallow this pill and it's going to make the fungus go away in your feet. They'd think you're nuts. Probably drive you out of town or something. Because they don't understand biochemistry, they don't understand digestion, they don't understand the bloodstream, they don't understand the germ theory, they don't even know that that's an infection is what it is. They maybe think it's some like evil spirit that's taken over their foot. How's this white pill going to do that? And so with education, we understand that taking a white pill could actually make fungus in the foot go away, right? We all of us here in this room understand that. So that's part of what you have to do in the lay lecture and the, the TBM video using the computer um, as a model for the body communicates that really effectively. So much so, when I practiced in Barcelona, um, I practiced at another office. This isn't one that I built. But I think it might be useful to talk about that practice a little bit too, because in that one was a hybrid practice. My first practice was a high volume chiropractic practice. No wellness visits, no holistic care. My second practice was all um, holistic care. But what we did in Barcelona in uh, Dr. Ramirez's office is we did a hybrid. So we had a high volume practice uh, Monday afternoon through Friday morning. And then we Monday morning and Friday afternoon is when we did our TBM sessions. Um, and then we could do brief TBM sessions during the week, but the, the full intensive ones were the, on the beginning and ends of the week. <clears throat> and when I started there, uh, the 
the doctor wouldn't let me show the video. And we went a few weeks and we had several patients that went to the front desk after the first visit and asked for their money back. So I said, he didn't do anything. All he did was just do these, just some clicks on my back and pushed on my arm. And of course there was also some language barrier there because my Spanish was, um, was Mexicanish and it wasn't all that great. And the vocabulary is very different in Spain and pronunciation is very different. And, and so that uh, element kind of entered in. But that wasn't the, the main reason, is that I also didn't have a lot of time to go into explaining all of this. So I went back to her and I said, we've got to show this video. And she says, well, I really don't like it. I said, well, let me show it to you again and tell me what you don't like and let's see if we can accommodate this somehow. And so I showed her the video and she says, oh, I was thinking of a different video. That one's fine. And uh, I about strangled her because it was really stressful <laughs> trying to practice with people to understand what I was doing. And, going to the front and the staff saying they want their money back and of course I didn't feel good about that and uh, as soon as we started showing the video never had that situation happen again and what I did in this setting was um, people came in for general chiropractic and as we were uh, uh, delivering chiropractic adjustment and taking care of people that way some people uh, responded really well and others not so well or they brought up issues that just wasn't going to respond with adjustments that needed something more and so I would explain that to them say we have another service we provide here called total body modification that uh, I think would really complement what we're doing with the adjustments um, go watch this video and after you watch the video if you then are wanting to, uh, to receive TBM, you can schedule it and, and we can do that. And my recollection is I don't remember a single person I had that conversation with and sent in and watched the video that didn't want TBM. And so the video is very enrolling. And so I would highly recommend showing that during this time. And I always showed it about halfway through. I divided, uh, jumping to my second practice, I divided that into the first half of the practice. I explained the, um, the syndrome that I specialized in, which at the time was fibromyalgia syndrome. So I would, I would explain it by textbook. I would go through history. I would go through um, the pathophysiology of it. <clears throat> all the different facets. I would talk about the medications used to treat it. Um, I would talk about how most of those medications are actually contraindicated for fibromyalgia, but they're the best other doctors knew to do. So they didn't have the types of solutions that, that I did. And then, actually I would start, let me back up a little bit, the anatomy of this. The first thing I would start with was I'd have a patient tell their story. That was the first thing. I'd have a patient um, explain this is what life was like. I came in, I got care, and this is what it's like now. And I would choose that patient from amongst my patients. <clears throat> and I, every time I taught this, <clears throat> I would basically get a new, um, a different patient. And it's, actually quite powerful for a patient to stand up and tell their, their story. And so I would try to rotate and give patients an opportunity to do that. Um, so the second part was basically going into, you know, basically the facts, if you will, behind whatever condition you're going to teach on. And I recommend choosing a topic that you think the community would give up an evening for. Realize you're competing with a lot of different things. Uh, I was in Utah, one of the things I was competing with was church functions and family functions because people fill up a lot of their time doing that. And so it had to be something compelling. 
and you have to get to know your community to find out you know, what that is. But just give the facts. This is where you let them know how knowledgeable you are, that, that you know what you're talking about. Uh, what you don't want is to have someone in the audience know more about the topic than you do. You want to impress them. And when I was practicing in my high volume practice, I had patients come in all the time because I didn't keep up with my knowledge that knew more about me, knew, I knew more about their case and their issues than I did. And uh, didn't like that. So after the facts, then show the video. And then I'd go through my program. Everything that was in my program, why it was in my program, what it was aimed to address, um, talk about the schedule. I would just explain that if you choose to be my patient, this is how we approach care. We start with a history consultation. We do our um, physical exam. I do extensive uh, laboratory and imaging testing. And I would, would tell them, and something that's true, you're, you're going to learn more about your body in this process than, than probably any place else you could go on this planet. So it's very, very comprehensive. Once we collect all this information, then we're going to sit down and we're going to put together a custom program to address why you're sick after we learn why you're sick through this process. So that's all in the... In, the program. <clears throat> really throughout all of this, um, I was always very personal. Uh, I myself am a fibromyalgia sufferer. That's my story. Fibromyalgia um, really went into full swing for me when I was eight. And by 12, uh, I was beginning to be disabled. And at age 12, I started studying nutrition and went from there um, basically just to keep my own body functioning and that's how I got into health and healing so I always tell that story and weave, weave that in so patients know that you know because if you look at me you would think I've never had a health problem in my life but the truth is is every day I work to maintain my health because I've lost it at such an early age and I learned to appreciate it and it's been something I've valued tremendously ever since. So that comes through when I teach. So the last thing here, which is very important, is giving them an opportunity to schedule to come into the practice. So you share all this, they're excited. Hopefully, if you've done your job, they're excited. If they're in the right place, they're excited. And my initial visit, consultation, um, I charge two and a quarter for that. It's an hour, I'd spend an entire hour with them. They fill out a large pre-packet. Which saves a tremendous amount of time in, in taking their history. So they've written it all out. They come in. We'll come back to this in a second. <clears throat> they'd come in. They'd have their packet. I'd sit down with them. I'd welcome them. I would thank them for filling out their packet. And tell them that I'm going to read every word that they've written in here. And I ask that while I do, that they remain quiet and that as I have questions going through it, I'll ask them. And I just had a yellow highlighter, mostly. As I read through and if I saw something I thought was important, um, I'd highlight it. And I'd go through their full history, about 10 pages of, of stuff. Uh, we're gonna be putting uh, all of my practice material together just as a PDF um, so you can use it to look at it to see what bits and pieces you might want to take just to create your own paperwork for your practice. Um, 
that's something that uh, we'll do within a couple weeks and, and we'll get that posted on our website. Um, so I'd go through that and once I would get through their history, you know, I would read through it, I'd ask them a few questions and I would say, is there anything not written in here or that you didn't just verbally communicate to me that you feel is important for me to know before we proceed. Now, I, would cr I crafted those words carefully. What I don't want them to do is retell me what I just read. So I don't say, is there anything you want me to know? Because they don't know that I know what I just read, right? So I say, is there anything not written in here that we also didn't just talk about because I have an hour and an hour sounds a lot of time, like a lot of time in a consultation or a history. But um, it's, it goes by fast, it goes by really fast. So generally, I'd say about 90% of the time, they'd say no, there's nothing more. And that's what you want, you wanna be thorough at that point. And if they was something, it was usually just one or two things. So once we've been done with, you know, kind of the, the history portion of this visit, then I put the paper down, I look him in the eye, and I say, I want you to imagine with me, it's six months from now. Our time together, the energy that we've devoted to this, to working together, to helping you, the money that you've spent, the time you've taken out of your life, the support you've garnered from other people have all been totally worth it because we have been wildly successful in this six months. You consider that it's been wildly successful because we accomplished three things. What are those three things? And then they would tell me. Well, I have energy. I'm sleeping well. And I would say, hold it, we only get three things. The first one, you said energy. In order to have energy, you've got to be sleeping well. So we're going to wrap sleeping well into the first one. So that frees up number two again. I'm like, oh, okay, great. Uh, I have no pain. Okay. And I'm off of all of my drugs. Perfect. What I just shared with you is probably about what 80% of my fibromyalgia suffers. I would want energy. Someone would talk about cognition. Just you know, I can, you know, I can think clearly. I can remember things, whatever. But we want to know how they're going to judge you. You know, you and I, we care about test findings. Right? We do exams, and we want to correct those things. They got low vitamin D. We want to restore their vitamin D. Um, you know, their, uh, you know, if all these body points are active, we want to clear those body points. You know, whatever it is, that's that's what we do as doctoring. The patient, they in the end really don't care about that. They just they want their life back. They want to feel better. So this is a chance for us to know how they're going to test us. This this is how they're going to judge us essentially. So we write those three things down. And sometimes patients will explain it in a way that isn't really that understandable. And so sometimes you have to coach them to like narrow it down. Oh, you, just, you want to be out of pain. Oh, you want to get off of your medications. Um, so getting these three things clear. And the first part was getting them. Okay, so let's just say the first one was energy, um, pain, and uh, off of their medications. After I get them, they have a tendency to just want to like talk about them. As soon as I would get them, I would, I would stop them from talking and say, let's move on to it because we're going to come back to that. I just want the one, two, three right now. And so we go back to energy. I said, okay, energy. I said, what question can I ask you, say 30 days from now, that will enable you to tell me 
whether you're doing better or not. In other words, how do you know you don't have enough energy right now? How does that show up in your life? And I'm like, well, I come home from work and I go straight to bed. I eat in bed and I wake up the next morning. I have to set my alarm clock 90 minutes early because it takes me an hour to get out of bed. And then I'm finally out the door and I go to work and I come home and it starts over again. So I hear stories like that and I'm like, okay. So if you came home from work and you were able to prepare dinner before you went to bed, would that be a dramatic improvement? Yes. Okay. So I'd write on their form, um, prepare dinner. And you said it takes an hour to get out of bed. Yes. Okay, if it took you a half hour to get out of bed, would that be a dramatic improvement? Yes. All right. So I put 30 minutes or less to get out of bed. So these are outcome measures, but based on their symptoms. I would do the same thing with pain. I'd say, well, what, um, what is it about your pain that is affecting your life that, that we could see? I'm like, well, I love to play um, golf, and I can't go play golf. I hurt too bad. Okay. So if you were to able to play golf once every two weeks, would that be an improvement? That would be a dramatic improvement. Okay. So golf every two weeks or more. Okay. Medications. That's kind of easy. Here are your medications. You know, that's easy to put that together in a so I would, I would pin these down, and, and for me, these were just as important as all the test findings that I found. Because in TBM, one, we regard symptoms as the language of the body. And you've heard that adage, the operation is a success, but the patient died. Maybe, would you mind handing me my water? Have you ever heard that before? A success, say it again. No, the, the, the operation was successful, but the patient died. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard that before? Hmm. Well, we don't want to be guilty of that. It's really not about raising a vitamin D level on a blood test. To you and I it is, but in the end it's, it's about this. This is where the rubber hits the pavement. So after I did that, the purpose of the, the lay lecture here is to sell the consultation. That's, that's the purpose of this. Plain and simple, overall, if you don't get their butt into your office for a consultation, you're never gonna take them any further, right? So that's, that's the purpose of this. The purpose of the consultation is to sell Your exams. You're going to take your patients through some sort of an exam process. Each practice may be different, the way that works. But that's the purpose of, of that is to sell the exam. So at this point, I say to them, based on your history, based on your goals, I feel confident that we can make this happen. I, I am, am in total um, congruence that in doing the right things and us working together, these are very achievable goals. But to chart the course to those goals, I need the information from your body what's happening inside your body so I can chart a course. And so we do our exams. So then I'd say, these are the exams I recommend. These are the fees. Uh, these are the ones that we're gonna do in office. These other here, you're gonna send samples to labs or you're gonna go to a lab and I don't know if you're gonna do blood draws in your office or not. I didn't like um, to do blood draws in my office because it's just, you have to have another staff member. It's just a whole other thing. I just sent them to, um, you know, another location where they could just get blood drawn and didn't have to worry about keeping all the supplies and forms and 
freezing stuff and spinning it down, etc. If you want to do that, great. Um, so I, I just I covered all of that and I said, here are the costs, and you pay today for the in-house costs that we have. So purpose here is to get them to commit to the consultation. Purpose of the consultation is to get them to commit to do the exams. Now, I didn't tell you what we do right here at the end of this, so I'm going to come back and do that now because I find myself wanting to jump here and then we just keep going. So with at the end of this um, class that you did, and you don't want this to be um, more than 90 minutes. Even a really entertaining presentation, you start getting beyond 90 minutes, that starts stretching people. So you want to keep it below 90 minutes. You do not want to allow any questions. Do not let people ask questions. At the beginning, at the very beginning of the evening, you must inform them of that. Say, I am committed to answer every single question that you have. And I will do it completely for free. And at the end of the, the presentation tonight, I'll tell you how to do that. But what I ask that you not do is ask any questions during the presentation. Questions disrupt your energy and your flow, and they, questions can sometimes, you'll have people come to your lecture that are there just to try to trip you up. Um, some people come intentionally, some people that's just what they do in life, they're just kind of naysayers, and you just don't want any of that energy. You have a direct flow that you're just, you have to start to end, you got your presentation, you get down here to the end, and you say, I want to be the doctor of all of you here. I want to be your doctor. I do great work, I care deeply about my patients, and I would love to help you. The first step towards me being able to help you, and becoming my patient, is for a consultation. I spend one hour with you face to face. And actually at the beginning of this, I tell them and we offer paper to write down their questions they have throughout the evening. So I want to answer the questions that you've written down tonight because what I don't want to do is have them at the end of the presentation come up and start peppering me with a bunch of questions or asking my staff all those questions. I'm usually, I put a lot of energy into this, so I'm usually ready to just go relax and have a meal someplace. And so I don't want to sit around and ask them a bunch of questions. Plus, if you answer their questions here, and you take away a lot of their motivation to show up here. Part of why they want to come here is to get you to answer their questions. And so the um, at the end here, what you're going to say to them is, I have a staff member here, and we have our appointment book, have copies of your appointment book, so they can do that or, or bring it up online. They probably just have a use Google Calendar or something. And say, we can schedule right now, and it will be absolutely free. Normally, it's two hundred twenty-five dollars, and for me, that that wasn't a, a fake number. I charge two hundred twenty-five all the time. If someone wanted to come straight into my practice without it, attending this course first, they paid the two twenty-five, and that happened regularly. So this is a real number, and say so I will waive that two hundred twenty-five dollar fee. I will sit down with you face to face for an hour and we'll go through your history, I'll answer all your questions, I'll make my recommendations and we'll see if it's a fit for us to work together and we'll take things from there if we think it is. And, but there are some rules. To get this for free, one, 
you must schedule tonight before you leave. Two, you must keep that appointment. You may not reschedule that appointment. Three, you must be on time for that appointment. Now on time, and this is very important, new patients are like puppies. You don't take a full-grown dog and try to train them. You train puppies. New patients will behave in your practice the way you train them to behave. I found that patients being late for appointments stressed me out. And I, I didn't look forward to going to my office. I'm like, well, who makes the rules in my office? I do. So, all right, new rule. You arrive 15 minutes early. That's on time. So, when do we teach them that rule? Because patients are like, new patients are like puppies. You train them right at the beginning. So I said, um, you have to be on time, which in my office is 15 minutes early. So if you schedule an 11 o'clock consultation time, what time do you arrive? No later than 10.45. You must be on time and you must have your packet completed. If you show up in the office, you don't have your packet completed, it's 225. If you show up at the office, you're not 15 minutes early, it's 225. So I explain all of this. I'm giving them a, a, you know, a pretty big gift, $225 at the time. Um, and I'm giving them an hour of my time. And this is what they have to do in return. Now, for this appointment, I'm, or sorry, for the, the lay lecture, our promotional materials encourage them to bring a support person. What you don't want to do in your practice is be sitting down here and saying, okay, it's time, you know, my fee for these, these tests um, was 2,500. And so at the end of this, appointment here, I would ask them for $2,500. And I don't want to be doing that to an 18 year old that lives at home and the parents have no idea what's going on and this 18 year old is disabled and really wants our care. But if you have the 18 year old and you have mom or dad or even better mom and dad, then you have the decision makers. Does that make sense? So, um, I like people coming here with those decision makers because this is where people get enthusiastic about what we do. And so I want the decision makers here. So I want the husband and wife here. I want the child and parent here. Now, maybe they're their own decision maker, but everyone likes to have the support of other people. And so I have them just bring the person that is going to support them. So they might bring their best friend to this. And so as they go through things, they can share what's going on with their best friend. And their best friend is connected because they've met me. They've been to the original presentation. So coming here, we obviously want those people to come here as well. Now, because of that, this is where I make an exception to changing the appointment. So I tell them, you have to schedule tonight, you have to um, keep the appointment, you have to be on time, which is 15 minutes early, you have to have your packet. And I say, if your support person is not here tonight, and you schedule an appointment, and you go home and find out your support person, your parent, your spouse, whatever, that you want to have here, can't make that time, but they can make a different time, we will reschedule. So you call the office and say, hey, this is what I'm scheduled. My husband can't make that time, but he can make a different day. We work something out. As long as they then show up with that support person for the new time, we don't charge them. So I don't want this right here, the this part to work against them having the support person there. So you want that. 
So then we sell the exams, and as an alternative provider, we have bias generally right up front. People all their life have been told that we're quacks. And one of the best ways to overcome that is tests, is to get hard copy data and to actually perform tests on the patient. So many patients now go to, um, what you want to call them, traditional doctors or whatever, conventional medicine, and hardly anyone does, does tests anymore. Based on your symptoms, I think this medication will help you. If it doesn't, we'll try something else. It's, it's using drugs basically to diagnose. That happens a lot. Patients don't like it. They don't feel like they're really being cared for. So I found one of the most enrolling things I could do. And you might think, who's going to pay $2,500 at the end of this? That's a lot of money. I found patients had no problems paying for tests. They were just like, thank you. Someone's going to test me. Someone's going to find out what's wrong with me. I've been to this doctor, to this doctor, to this doctor, to this doctor. No one did tests, you know, and they, they, they just tried this, it didn't work. Finally, someone's actually going to test me. I, did, I never found this to be a hard sell, ever. The harder sell is at the, the report of finding visits for care, but that, if everything is done properly here, that really generally wasn't that hard of a sell. But it, it was a little bit harder than, than this right here, selling the exams. Now, if someone didn't have health insurance, it was $2,500. If someone had health insurance, it was fifteen. dollars Because we could outsource some things. So you figure out whatever your range is based on what tests you think are important for you to do the job. So, um, the, the other exception on rescheduling, since I lived in a, a place where it snowed, I would say if your health or safety or the health or safety of another person would possibly be adversely affected by you keeping this appointment, we'll be happy to reschedule. And I use the example and say, for instance, the freeways are covered in ice. It's the dead of winter. Call and reschedule. Don't risk your life trying to get to this appointment that you committed to um, because of that. So I do let them know that because I didn't ever want to have an accident happen because someone was trying to get to the appointment on unsafe roads, for instance. All right, so that takes us to the exams. So in the exam is basically for you to get the information you need. So when you get to the report of findings, You have the information you need to, one, chart a course that you're confident that you're not missing things. How did I get into laboratory testing? Because I would, well, the first place I got into is I developed anemia in working out. So I started going to the gym, lifting weights, etc. And I walked from my uh, downstairs basement up to the main floor and I got to the top of the stairs. And I'm breathing hard. I'm like, if I didn't know better, I, I would say I have anemia. And that, that thought dawned on me. I'm like, I'm going to go get my blood tested. I went and tested, and I did have anemia. I'm like, huh. I wonder if any of my patients have anemia. And so I had some patients that, that were tired all the time. And we did a CBC with them, and they had anemia. I'm like, oh, all right. I was trying to fix it through other ways. And, and that's what got me in, into that, and this beer leads to heroin. It's a little bit of a joke, by the way. Um, you like that one? <laughs> <laughs> so we happened to have the, uh, the, the director for sales and promotion of Pabst Blue Ribbon here in the room. So at any rate, if beer leads to heroin, anemia testing led me to be to develop the largest panel that LabCorp, which is the number one uh, physician uh, uh, 
based lab testing company in the United States. Um, my panel was the largest one nationwide they'd ever approved because I tested so many different things in the blood. Why? Because I got sick of being blindsided and I did not want to be blindsided. I did not want to be six months into care and find out they're not getting good results because their vitamin D was low and I didn't know it because I didn't test it. So anything I thought I wanted to know so we could address it right up front to increase the chance of day one we just take off and the patient is getting better. I included it in my tests. So that's what goes in here. The report of findings, I reviewed the tests. Everything that was, that was a problem, I went through. And with my patients, it was a lot. I attracted very sick patients. And so I would cover all of that information. Question. Yes. Do you review the exams on your own time or do you review the exams with the patient in mind? Okay, it's a good question. Um, there's a couple different, I actually did it different at different times in my practice. The, the first thing I, what I, what I did, and I don't recommend doing this, um, I created a spreadsheet and I put no, normal values for all the labs mm -hmm. and we punched everything out, a staff member did, we punched everything into that and generated this. Over time, that was so time intensive that I actually wouldn't even look at all my findings until the report of findings. That being said, that was years into it where I was really a master at reading tests and putting things together so I could read their, their results. No, that wasn't true. I always did a letter. I always did a letter in advance and I'd have staff members help me do this. And I would write in that letter, these are the key findings, these are the diagnoses, and this is our recommended plan of care. So I would give them that. I'd also give them a copy of every test, and I did it in a binder. So it's kind of labor intensive. Um, the initial time I always did that, it was follow-up testing that I wouldn't look at until I sat down with the patient. Of course, we'd screen it as soon as the test was done for any emergency stuff. Um, you know, if there was something critical, we don't want to wait, you know, two weeks till they come back to go through the findings. But beyond screening that, I, I wouldn't really go through and compare the old ones to the new ones. I do that in their presence while they're paying me, basically. Part of this $2,500, $1,500 fee was actually going through and creating that patient binder. In that patient binder is a bunch of education material, putting all their numbers into the spreadsheet. And I would take one to two hours, personally going through this information, putting together their care plan. The care plan was all written up and the fees and everything were all written up. Um, I gave a 10% reduction if they paid in advance for the program. Some people out there say, tell them that and then make it not refundable. Um, I never did that. At any point, if someone wanted to, to stop care and wanted a refund, I would, I would do it. Didn't happen very often. Um, maybe two or three times in 10 years in, in running this particular practice. Um, but I, I'm never gonna fight a patient that they wanted to get you know, their money back. Of course, the services that they got for 90%, if they wanted their money back, we would have to re-rate those services at 100%, calculate the difference and give them their money back. So, <clears throat> in the report of findings, the purpose of the report of findings is what? What do you imagine the purpose of the report of findings is? It's to sell the care plan. If you don't sell the care plan, then they're never going to come into 
your practice and get care. So your care plan may just be you. You might have other professionals come in and work in your office. I had several other professionals. One of the things I didn't like about my first practice, my high volume practice, is I was the, um, the income generator. Me putting my hands on the patients is how we earned money. If I wasn't there, no money was made in the practice. With my second practice, um, I was free to come and go because I had so many paraprofessionals there doing work. Um, I had a, a massage therapist doing structural migration. We did traction in our office. Um, we did trigger point therapy. We did cranial sacral therapy. We did posture training. Uh, this massage therapist um, also got fully trained in TBM. So a lot of the basics of TBM. What I did were the physical exams. I did the chiropractic adjustments and I did advanced TBM. So my paraprofessional took them through the basic exams. And once they got them through that, then I would pick up with the patient. So if I wasn't there, if I was gone for a week, my practice kept running, my patients got taken care of, and we still earned money. And that was a great thing. So you can put whatever you want in your care plan. So don't feel like you have to just limit it to only you, the services you specifically provide. You can bring other people in on that. So I happen to believe in courtship before marriage. This is courtship. This is where the marriage happens. I constantly hear doctors say, my patients won't follow my recommendations. My patients don't follow through with their care. My patients aren't motivated. My patients, they don't understand what, what they do. They still think in a different way. This process is about bringing me and my patient together in a commitment to get results. And I got results, phenomenal results, rapid results that nobody else was getting. Typically, my care plan, and, and we're back, we're talking the early 2000s, was eight to eight to ten thousand dollars was my care plan. So my patients would pay fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred here, and they'd pay eight to ten thousand dollars for the care plan, and I had about an eighty percent prepay rate. So most of my patients, the the care plan oftentimes added up to like eleven thousand and some change. If they prepaid. That would take 10% off of that. So they'd end up someplace between the eight and 10,000 range if they prepaid. I had more patients that I could handle doing this. Why would someone, um, and, and I had patients literally sell their homes, vacation property, cancel vacations, um, get money from friends and relatives, etc., to pay for this. And it was money well spent. Every single dollar my patients spent to me was a sacred trust. This is a good business model, but it's not why I did it. I did it because this is what created the best opportunity for success for that patient to get what they wanted. I was in business to give people what they wanted. But I had to take these three goals right here and build around that a way to actually accomplish that. People have to change their lifestyle. They have to take supplements. They have to pay money out of pocket. They've got to take time. They've got to be motivated. They have to understand why we're doing this. And my patients were ecstatic. Not once did I ever have someone come to me and say, I wasted my money. These are the people that would come back here and do the testimonials. I generally would sit in the back of the room 
and cry as they would tell their story. One of my favorite parts about this is in the practice, what, what's a patient's job? Their job is to show up and say, this is where I still hurt, this is where I still don't feel right, this is what's still happening. That's their job, to tell us that. It's not really a celebration time. Sometimes we would do that, we would have celebrations about accomplishments, but in general it was, we've got work to do. This was the celebration time. When they would get in front of this group of people, I'd usually, it would range, um, I averaged probably 50 when I did the once a month. When I did the weekly in my practice, um, I averaged probably about 25 on my weekly. And so, so this is that. So the next question is, is how do you get people from here into to your lecture? So first off, I lowered the barrier by holding my lectures in hotels. So I'd, I'd cop up a couple hundred bucks, I would rent a, a, down at the Marriott or Hampton Inn or someplace, and I would just get a meeting room, and that's where I would do it. Because patients, the public, feel much safer going to a neutral location than they do going into your practice. Because they know if they come into your practice, this is your domain. And they're afraid because you're a quack, which means you might be, you might try to rip them off. And you go into their practice, you might lock the doors and who knows what's gonna happen. And you don't think that's accurate, you wait. I mean, people have a lot of crazy ideas about what a chiropractor is or a naturopath or acupuncturist, they have no idea. So if you go to a neutral place like a hotel, some people like to choose really the ritziest hotel, like a St. Regis or something, and do it. You might want to do that if that's like an image you want to project. To me, I just I just wanted a room. So I looked around for a decent room. It was a fair price, and we'd go with that. Um, and let me tell you also, the my second practice, um, kind of the boutique uh, specialty practice, I was in the basement of an old building in the corner. And walking into my office was like, uh, I mean, it was just dark and gray and cold. It was horrid. Now, when you walked into my office, I had bright colors, I had nice music, and, and things really changed once you got into practice. But it was an in, it was an inexpensive place. I've always I always kept overhead really low. Overhead will kill a practice faster than anything else. So. How do we get people from here to the lay lecture? So one, we lower the barrier by having a neutral location. But I'll tell you the things that I did. Um, going back to my first practice, I delivered flyers anywhere and everywhere I could. So I created a flyer for it and I would go out. Because I did it every week um, with my patients, I gave my patients an incentive what I did back then was if someone came to that, we didn't charge them for extras. So patients would tell their friends about how cool the, our office was. And they would tell their friends, and if you go to this lecture, you don't have to pay for your extras. So that would help feed that. But I, uh, there was something back then, and, and I think they still exist here, called Curves. It's a, a women's only gymnasium. And uh, easily 80% of my practice were women. Um, but we would also go to other health clinics. We'd go to health food stores and deliver flyers. Every place I could put out a flyer, I put out a flyer. And the flyer had to be compelling. So again, that's based on your community, a topic that's compelling. So you have a whole bunch of people with carpal tunnel in your community, you can do a carpal tunnel lecture. You have a whole bunch of people irritable bowel, do it on irritable bowel. And the model is you just present the facts, do your testimonial, present the facts on whatever topic you're doing, show the video, and then tell them how you resolve it, give them a chance to schedule. And you can change the topic. It, um, when I transitioned from my high volume practice 
to my specialty practice in the interim actually just did rotating topics. Uh, women's hormones, and uh, weight loss, all sorts of things. And then I settled in on fibromyalgia um, and included chronic fatigue, multiple sclerosis, lupus um, when I switched to that specialty practice. So flyers are very inexpensive. Obviously, I didn't, I didn't have back then social media. So you're gonna include, you got social media that you can do. So you got flyers, social media. But um, the most valuable asset you have is the contact information of potential patients. So on your Facebook page, you have a way to sign up for your newsletter. On your Twitter account, you have these people that come here, you collect. When they come in and they sign in, you get their email address. And you notify them of future classes. If you're gonna create a website, the purpose of your website is to get someone's email address. So you can get them to come to this. If you get someone to spend 90 minutes with you, you're gonna have a high percentage of them are gonna end up all the way here. Now that being said, my numbers, the way I, the way I calculated, I, I did better than this, but this is, this is how I did my math. If I had 50 come here, I would plan on 25 coming here and um, 12 going through this process and six doing a care plan. That's how I would do the math. So if I had 50 people here, that would generate 60,000 in revenue. That's how I would look at it, my numbers. Um, I, I did, yeah, my, I was probably more like 70%. I'd get about a 30% attrition each jump. So maybe about a third of the people who did the report of findings didn't become patients, which to me is like crazy high. But it's always still a numbers game. Not everyone is gonna go through the whole process. I also did radio advertising. But again, I think social media has taken the place of all of that. You can do a social media campaign, you can have blogs. But you have to find a way for people to learn about this. Also, patients, we talked about hairstyles, how they were talking to people, other healthcare professionals, um, you know, places where you can disseminate uh, your flyers or get people to talk about that. So this is the model that I used to build two very successful practices. And it's very fun. I wanted to just talk a little bit about the practice. First and foremost, about the uh, for everyone at home, Megan's giving me looks like, seriously, you're gonna keep going? So <laughs> we've got just one last topic. And that is the practice itself, it has to be yours. And it has to be fun for you. I created all sorts of, of rules that my patients had to follow to be my patient to take the stress out of practice. So they had to arrive 15 minutes early. If they um, didn't prepay, um, I took a $500 retainer. If they missed an appointment, we took it out of the retainer. And when they came in for the next appointment, they had to replenish that retainer. After doing that for several years, actually after the market crashed in 2008, 2009, we dropped that retainer to 250. I did all sorts of things to make my practice a fun place for me to go to. Because you know what? Your staff is gonna come and go and your patients are gonna come and go, but you are not. And if you don't have a place that nourishes you, that's joyful and fun to be in, and you don't, you know, you wanna feel powerful and in your game, and um, so you, you create your space. Don't let patients dictate your hours. Don't let patients dictate your decor. Don't let patients dictate what material. I never had Time Magazine and the newspaper and stuff like that. I had only had information like I see you creating over there of health books that supported what I was doing. 
So I created the practice really for me, and I didn't burn out. You create your patient, your practice for your patients. You let them dictate everything. Um, I think you're going to have a much higher risk of burning out. So keep this whole process fun. It really is fun to be a doctor. It's fun to teach. It's fun to do this, and uh, you're going to have a great time.